Good morning. Good morning. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Welcome to worship here at Hope Presbyterian Church. It's good to see you all this morning. We give thanks for the opportunity to gather together in worship and in fellowship. And as much as we love the rain, we give thanks for the roads drying out. A few announcements for us this morning. Make a note to bring a couple of cans of tuna next Sunday. Uh, Swess is in need of tuna to feed their uh, the folks that come to see them that are in need. So if you can pick up an extra can or two of tuna at the grocery store this week, bring it next Sunday, and we'll take that collection on over to Swess. A couple notes about meetings. Um, the trustees and the deacons are meeting this afternoon right after worship uh, for their monthly meetings. And session is meeting tomorrow evening uh, for their monthly meetings. So look forward to seeing folks at our various uh, committee meetings uh, today and tomorrow. Also, if you take notes, uh, the middle hymn on page 506, titled, Look Who Gathers at Christ's Table. Uh, it's a familiar tune, or a, a singable tune, but it might be a little unfamiliar. Um, so Scott's going to play it through one time, and then we will sing the hymn together. But that will hopefully help us to uh, get a little familiarity with the, with the tune itself. One last announcement regarding the yard sale. Naomi? Okay, very exciting the yard sale. Uh, we have a few people that have agreed to sign up. Uh, they're going to be selling their own stuff, and there's still time to sign up if you want a space with or without a table. Also, we could use some bags, paper or plastic, it doesn't matter. This helps us out with not only putting these items that you sell in the bags, but also for wrapping glassware, things like that. Also, and another thing, we usually, we leave the stuff up for the Hope people to see Sunday and for NABC Sunday night. We're not going to be doing that this year because we're having a um, a company called Green Pump. <clears throat> They're going to come Monday morning to pick up everything that we want to give them for free. So we won't have to have a bunch of trucks going here and there. So if there's anything that you want, it will be all packed up Sunday. You can go through the boxes if you like and make a donation, but it won't be out on tables. So come to your town. And so that's next Saturday morning? At, yes, this next Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Yes, May 13th. We do give thanks for the opportunity to gather together in worship. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share that peace with one another.
peace candle has been lit, so let us pray. A prayer for peace. Compassionate God and Father of all, we are horrified at violence in so many parts of the world. It seems that none are safe and many are terrified. Hold back the hands that kill in name. Turn around the hearts that hate. Grant instead your strong spirit of peace. Peace that passes our understanding, but change lives. What changes lives through Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace. Amen. There are many ways in which we fail to be like Jesus. We sin. We must confess. Let us confess together. Holy God, we confess to you and to one another that we have not always followed Christ's example. We have been abused. We have been abusive in return. We have been led astray by false gods and have built idols for our own communities. You are the shepherd. Help us to hear your voice. Lead us back into your fold and guard our souls. Friends, the promise of our faith is that we is that if we entrust ourselves to the one who judges justly, we need not feel threatened, for we will be returned to righteousness. In the grace of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.
resurrected from the dead. The book opens, and we'll read this in a couple of weeks, the book opens with the blessing of Pentecost, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the, the paraclete. Not the parakeet. <laughs> Didn't we talk about it a few weeks ago? Like getting the giggles? The paraclete, the Holy Spirit. The very Spirit of God dwelling within us. But here, this morning, just a chapter later, they are still again sitting around trying to figure out what's next. How to dedicate their lives to God and to follow the ways of the risen Christ. Now by comparison, John's Gospel doesn't really track the events following Jesus' resurrection other than a couple of brief appearances. Although John does sort of conflate a few things that we see in Acts, he offers a brief commissioning, a brief Pentecost. The very same kind of instruction that we see being played out this morning, them dedicating their lives to the risen Christ and trying to figure out what's next. John describes it this way. This is in John 20. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them, showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus again said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive any, the sin of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sin of any, they are retained. Francis Ginch writes that for the disciples hiding in the upper room following Jesus' crucifixion, wrestling with the meaning of, this, of his resurrection, Jesus' appearances to them were calls for them to represent him by continuing his ministry. They were called to re-present him through to the world, through the lens of resurrection, to re-present, show him again. She writes it this way, quote, the disciples were to so mirror Jesus that those who encounter them are forced to make a decision in their lives. They, these disciples, will re-present Christ. This, and this call will call forth, and this will call forth a response, a decision that will determine whether sins are forgiven or sins retained. As disciples, we represent the risen Christ to the world. That's an interesting and important echo to the words of our morning reading from John's Gospel. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, and the sheep, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. And we've got a lot of passages swirling around at this point, don't, don't we? I'm going to try and put them in chronological order for us. The first being from John 10, what we just read. In John 10, Jesus writes, I am the gate, whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. Those words were echoed later following the resurrection in John 20. Receive the Holy Spirit, Jesus says. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. And then later in Acts 2, Jesus' disciples attempting to live out his command. Quote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. They and we are called to represent Jesus through the lens of the resurrection. To represent Jesus through the lens of the resurrection. 
The other passage is about the gate, Jesus being the shepherd and the sheep coming and going through the gate. It's a funny image for modern folk who don't live on farms to think about gates. Is the gate designed to keep something out? Or is the gate designed to keep something in? I'm not sure. Is the pasture inside the gate? Or is the pasture somewhere outside the gate? Because Jesus says, whoever enters by me will be saved and will come and go and find pasture. So which is it? He's not even clear about it. For too long, though, I think we've used the imagery of a gate or a wall in an oppressive way. I may have told this short story before, this anecdote before, but a number of years ago, Marcy and I lived in Dallas. And I was blown away when we first moved there by the amount of fencing that I saw. And we're not talking about out in the brush or out in the suburbs where there are farms and, and, and cattle ranches. This is in the city itself. Every house it seemed had an eight foot tall fence around it. Our house was no exception. Our backyard was enclosed with an eight foot tall board on board fence. And that wasn't enough. We bought it this way. It was reinforced with steel piping that was in concrete footers. What was it that they thought they were protecting, I wonder? And since every one of my neighbors had the same kind of fencing, what were they hiding? That's the curious thing. I don't know. I didn't spend much time on Google Earth looking at my neighbors from the satellite view. Anyway, fences come in a variety of forms, don't they? Gates come in a variety of forms, too. Literal gates and fences, but also figurative gates and fences. Ways of keeping things out and keeping things in. It's an easy way to differentiate the us and the them. When I was in grade school, it was the kids who had the Trapper Keeper notebook versus the kids who only had pocket folders. That was the gate or the fence between the kids, the losers and the cool kids. And that's the way kids treat each other, right? It's little things like that. As adults, we do it with real estate. Neighborhood covenants keep minorities out of certain areas. Or at least historically, they, they kept people from buying in certain neighborhoods. Interestingly enough, people are trying to bring these laws back both in real estate and in public schools, trying to redistrict for the sake of keeping people apart, creating new gates and new fences. We've done it here at church, too. Catholics put a restriction on who can receive communion, who can serve as an ordained person. Presbyterians, we the beautiful, wonderful people that we are, have ostracized gays for decades <laughs> And only recently have amended our Constitution, though interestingly enough, there are loopholes within Presbytery bylaws to allow such discrimination to continue. At the local church level, we've created barriers to entering through the very, these very doors, assuming or writing unwritten laws about dress codes or about an educational assumption in order to listen to a sermon or understand the liturgy. And we've done these things in a place that's ironically called a sanctuary. If we're going to keep locking the gates, putting up fences, we may need to find a new name for this room. So much for representing, representing the risen, loving, correct, loving, and correct grace giving Christ to the world. There's one more gate worth mentioning on this. It's the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. It's not a done deal. The pastor is not getting political. It's not a done deal, but it's, it has to go to the Senate. It's got to go through conference. Only then, if it's alive, does it go to the president's desk. But it's an interesting gate. A line of demarcation for a supposedly Christian nation. Who are the cool kids? Who are the losers? when it comes through this gate. Sorry, I 
literally just, just held my hand and then I was like, walked out the door without my like, winning them off. Kind of freaked me out for a second. But I know where it's at, so it's okay. Who, who are the cool kids when it comes to this build? Who are the losers? Who's inside the pasture? Who's left out? And I say the pastor's not getting political for this reason. It's important for us to talk about because there are 22 Presbyterian uh, brothers and sisters in the United States House of Representatives. There are another 12 in the Senate. And supposedly they are informed by their faith when they cast their votes. How is our Christian faith, our Presbyterian heritage, representing Jesus here today with that vote? Now, if you haven't seen the news, I'll try and summarize things briefly. The sticking point this go around was pre existing conditions. A provision was made, I've got other stories about that, and a bill was passed along party lines. But there were exceptions to the exception. You could still, you can still be excluded from your care Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance. Have you seen the list of other exclusions that are still hanging out there? Here's a smattering. There's over 200. Here's just a couple. If you have adult acne, if you have asthma, kidney stones, certain cancers, Down syndrome, heart disease, chronic heartburn, blood clots, heart murmur, COPD, ulcers, all good reasons to kick you off the planet, according to the Congress. Who's getting kicked out? Who's being welcomed in? A few more exceptions, exclusions. HIV AIDS, hepatitis C, breast cancer, cervical cancer, sickle cell anemia. So if you've never used IV drugs, if you've never had unprotected sex, if you are a woman, just simply a woman, or if you happen to be black, you can automatically be kicked off your planet. That's an interesting thing for Christians to do to one another. Now, interestingly enough, provisions were made to protect coverage for folks who happen to get testicular cancer, happen to get prostate cancer, and to protect care for those with erectile dysfunction. But birth control is not covered. Isn't that interesting? What gates are we opening? What fences are we building? Who are the cool kids and who's left out? Good Christian people, aren't we? The world is full of fences. Gates designed to keep certain people or things in, others out. We, as church, are called upon to represent Represent, show again the risen Christ to the world. We are called to put our faith into action. That's what those disciples were trying to do when they were in the upper room in Acts 2, trying to figure out what is next. Quote, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Folks, we live in the grace of the resurrection. And Christ is calling on us today to be people of welcome. For it is by our actions, our actions, that we are known. The fences we build, the gates we close, are impediments to the living out of Christ's gospel. Jesus came to give life and life that is full of abundance. As his followers, we cannot close his gate without excluding Christ himself, the very Christ we proclaim this morning on the fourth Sunday of Easter. We close the, when we close the gate against the ill, against the uneducated, against the minority, against the naked, we keep out the risen Christ. Friends, the call upon our lives is to fling wide the gates, to welcome all, 
to this table. That is the gospel that he proclaims. That is the charge upon us today. Amen.
We have all received good things from God. Now is the time to bring them back with joyful thanks.
so that no one will live in fear. And indeed, O oh Lord, we pray for those who are in need, for those who are left wanting by the modern world, for those ill and those dying, that we may be your people, that we may anoint them and feed them and comfort them in your name, and that they may know you by this freedom. You, O oh God, are the blessed, blessed Shepherd, and it is through Christ our Lord that we know you, and it is the Holy Spirit that paraclete that dwells with us still, giving us and showing us your goodness, your mercy, leading us down the right paths and restoring our souls. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Friends, Jesus said, Come to me, you who, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Friends, this is the table of the risen Lord. It is the joyful feast of all God's people. Young and old, weak and strong, ill and robust, those who question and those who are unwavering, all who seek to know the Lord are welcome at this table. In a few minutes, when we come to the table, or when the bread and the cup are brought to you, we invite you to go ahead and eat the bread, but hold the cup and we will drink together at the end. Join me in the litany. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Let us pray. Glorious God, we give you thanks and praise. For on this day creation sings, Christ is risen from the dead. He has burst forth from the tomb to break the tangles of despair and death. Love has come again. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with the eternal chorus of rejoicing and who sing forever. Savior Jesus Christ, 
Breathe your spirit upon the whole earth, and we may proclaim good news to all the world, and rise together as children of your new creation. Then, O Lord, bring us to that new heaven here on earth, where death and pain are no more, and you dwell with us forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we worship you eternally in songs of pure, unbounded praise. Amen. Friends, on the night of Jesus' arrest, when he was at table with his friends, he took the bread and he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup represents the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the risen Christ until he comes again in glory. Friends, the table is prepared. Take and eat.
God and the people of God. Thank you very much. Let us pray together. Our Father, our Lord, Amen. Yeah. 